Hey Kim, do you have any idea on what's so special about today? Oh yeah, it's our first webinar. Woo! Good morning to everyone. Welcome to Understanding Parkinson's Medication Webinar, prepared by third-year pharmacy students from International Medical University, IMU, in collaboration with MPDA. I'm Xiao Qin. And I'm Kimberly. We are your MCs for today. Okay, so before we start our sessions, we have some reminders for every participants to take note of. So first of all, please note that this webinar will be recorded. Okay, secondly, please mic your mic, please mute your mic throughout the sessions. Thirdly, please type your questions in the chat box. And lastly, we will be having a group photography session at the end of the session. Please turn on your camera if you are comfortable to do so at the end of the session. We will give you a reminder that time. So these are the organizing committees. Come pharmacy students from IMU. We have Rakshana, Xiaoqing, Jenkai, Jiaxing, Roshini, and Peizhi. Today, we will be having three activities. First of all, a 15-minute session on knowing Parkinson's disease. Secondly, a 45-minute session on eight questions about Parkinson's disease medication by Dr. Wong Peizhi. And lastly, we will be having a 15-minute question and answer and feedback session. So without further delay, let's start on our first session of the day, Knowing Parkinson's Disease. The speakers are our group mates, Rashana and Peizu from IMU. A gender reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and we will raise them up at the end of the session. Thank you. Now, now let us invite Rakshana and Peizu. A very good afternoon to all. I'm Rakshana. And I'm Peizu. And we are third year IMU pharmacy students. Today, we are going to give a brief yet informative introduction on Parkinson's disease. Without further ado, let's start, off, start our session. I would like to start off with a general question. So what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease is a progressive condition in which small regions in the brain that controls movement, posture, and balance are being affected. Since it is a disorder that affects our body movements, Parkinson's disease belongs to a group of conditions known as motor system disorders. Did you know that people usually develop Parkinson's disease around age 60 or older? Besides, it is shown to affect 1% of population above 60 years old. 5 to 10% of Parkinson's disease is caused by genetic factors. It is also more common in men than women and more prevalent in developed countries. Then, how do you know you have Parkinson's disease? People with Parkinson's usually exhibit symptoms such as tremor or also known as trembling hands, arms, legs, jaw or head, stiffness of limbs and trunks, slowness of movement, depression, and lastly, impaired balance and coordination that will sometimes lead to fall. A diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is likely if you have at least two of the three following symptoms. Firstly, shaking or tremor in a part of your body that usually only occurs at rest. Secondly, slowness of movement, bradykinesia. Thirdly, muscle stiffness or rigidity. So, as I previously mentioned before, Parkinsonism is a brain disorder. In our brain, we have a lot of cells known as nerve cells. And the nerve cells at some part of our brain will release a chemical known as dopamine. So what is this dopamine? Dopamine in our brain helps to control and coordinate our body movements. In Parkinson's disease, the nerve cells that release dopamine becomes damaged or dies. So that means the amount of dopamine in our brain will also reduce. If the amount of dopamine reduces, then it will cause movement problems in our body. For example, like the symptoms that was mentioned before, and that is also shown in this picture, such as masked facial expression, stooped posture, rigidity, shaking of hands or legs, slow movement and balance issues. 
There are some tips for the Parkinson's disease or their family member to help in coping with this disease. For instance, when walking, walk slowly with a strapped posture and with your legs further apart. Always think about taking big steps to help to keep your steps more normal. You may use a suitable cane or walker if necessary. Lastly, when stand up from chair or bed, try to move slowly to avoid dizziness or lightheaded. Parkinson's disease family members can also help by installing grab bars on toilet or shower to help him or her to stand up. Besides, you can also install an elevated toilet seat to make standing up easier after using the toilet. While dressing, try to wear simple clothes or pants with elastic waistbands such as sweatpants as well as loafers or slippers. Lastly, as the family member, you should always be observant of the changes in symptoms, abilities and moods of the patient, especially after changes in medication or therapy. Go along with the patient for his appointment with doctor to ask questions, take notes, and share your unique perspective on symptoms and other issues that he may not bring up, such as sleeping problems or mood disorder. So, to quickly recap, Parkinson's disease is a brain disorder that affects male more than female, mostly above 60 years old. When nerve cells in our brain gets damaged or dies, the chemical known as dopamine reduces in our brain that causes more movement problems. Even if this is a lifelong condition, do not worry. There are lots of techniques that can be used to cope up with Parkinson's. That's all from us. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Rashana and Paisel, for the interesting presentation. We believe that everyone has gained a better understanding on Parkinson's disease right now. So now let's move on to our second session, Eight Questions About Parkinson's Disease by Dr. Wong Paisel. A short introduction about Dr. Wong. She's currently a senior lecturer in School of Pharmacy in International Medical University, IMU. She's a pharmacist by profession, graduated in 1998. She has experiences working in hospital before joining IMU as a lecturer. She also has experiences working in community pharmacy. Her research work now focuses on the roles of pharmacists. She was previously active in some community service work, including IMU Foundation Clinic, which provides medical care to the underprivileged population. A gentle reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll raise them up at the end of the session. Now, are you excited to know more about how to manage Parkinson's disease medication? So without further ado, let's invite Dr. Wang Peizi. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Peizi. Okay, um, it's my pleasure today to share with you a little bit about medicine. So I'm going to now uh, just share my screen. Okay. Okay, can you hear me well? Can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? Can you hear me well? Yes, you can see. Yes. Okay, all right, okay. So as I mentioned, I think, thank you everyone. I think the uh, presentation today, what we're gonna try to, uh, what I'm gonna try to do today is trying to share with you perhaps uh, different things about this uh, Parkinson uh, medication. Okay, I, I, I know that, I mean, with the time and everybody probably taking different drugs, it's unlikely that I'll be able to talk uh, about one drug, um, you know, every single drugs that you might be taking, uh, but we have uh, tried to arrange it into eight different types of questions and try to make you understand a bit more about medicine. Uh, and of course, as mentioned just now, if you have any questions relating to medicine, uh, please feel free to type into the chat box and and we will try to answer you uh, at the end. Yeah, so uh, just a, 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 to start with, I think the first questions that uh, commonly brought about is really um, what do medicine um, do, you know, or what, what can, uh, why are we using the Parkinson disease medicine, why they are prescribed, 
Okay, so if you if you listen to the earlier speakers, then you will realize that I think the Parkinson disease, I think majorly, primarily, I think affect a lot of different motor function. Okay, uh, example, resting tremors, you have a slowness of movement, sometimes stiffness and inflexibility. Of course, everybody might have slightly different uh, types of problems or symptoms that they are encountering, but um, the Parkinson disease medicine itself are usually prescribed to control this type of symptoms. So it does have a proven benefit in trying to manage or uh, 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 make the symptoms better or improve the symptoms. And by doing that, what it can do then is then to maintain back certain functional uh, types of daily activities. Example, if you are still able, you are still working or you're still involving in certain types of technical work, you know, that will be able to help you in controlling some of your movement. So very much um, what we, I'm trying to say is that uh, Parkinson's disease medicine, I think not just aiming to stop all the symptoms that you're having, but trying to also allowing you to maintain certain function or activities that you like to do in your daily life. And that's usually what we are looking for in a long term management of uh, Parkinson, using Parkinson disease medicine. All right. Or in short here, I think I, we were saying PD medicine. Okay, second, I think the third question sometimes that people ask is that, uh, you know, is there really benefits of Parkinson medicine disease, uh, Parkinson disease medicine in slowing down progression? I think I'm um, happy to, to sort of share that there are some studies that actually say that, you know, some Parkinson disease medicine might be helping in slowing down progression and some of them may potentially also help to slow rate slow the rate of so uh, you know how uh, Parkinson's disease are progression but unfortunately the evidence are a little bit scanty at the moment which means that there is no uniform or strong evidence to support that uh, so hopefully we're going to get more research studies ongoing to sort of confirm whether they are exact benefit or which medication does have that benefit so at the moment it's, it's really a, a sort of a question mark in our head Okay, um, there are many different types of uh, Parkinson disease medicine. I think overall, perhaps we have uh, more than 10 or maybe around 10 different types and they all contain different medication inside. Um, I'm sure, I think if you look at the first three uh, pictures here, Madopa, Cinemat, you know, star level, you probably, I think some of you may are taking it and you probably will recognize that there are component inside which is very recognized called, uh, that's recognized and called levodopa. Levodopa basically is probably the mainstay or the most important medication inside Parkinson's disease uh, management. So it's frequently a component of uh, this medication. Um, I, I suppose um, if we look at look back at the history, it has been probably used as the primary medication in Parkinson disease management for over 40 years. So um, I think one thing for sure is that we know very well it works very well in controlling the symptoms. And in some cases, of course, if the uh, Parkinson disease has gone advanced, they might be challenging to challenges to just use Parkin uh, level dopa alone. So in that case, uh, some patient may get uh, additional um, types of drugs to be add on to help to control some of the symptoms. Okay. All right. So when is the best time for you to start uh, Parkinson disease medicine? Um, is it as soon as you're diagnosed or is it when the symptoms get more troublesome and affecting daily life? I think these questions ultimately usually come back to uh, the patient themselves because any starting or any initiation or uh, introduction or starting of any medicine, I think will need to thoroughly be discussed um, depending on how severe is your problem now. Um, are you ready to start the medication and how problematic or how bothering is the symptoms uh, uh, affecting your daily life? I think what is more common is that uh, most patients would opt to take the medication when the symptoms are affecting very much about uh, uh, affecting their life. You know, example, they are not able to carry out certain work because of the symptoms and the, or the symptoms are getting more progressive and it does affect their work, their life or even their movement. So um, that's usually the point that the patient decide, um, you know, uh, that they should probably start the medication to control some of the symptoms. And but of course, from the perspective of, uh, of uh, as a pharmacist or healthcare professional, we normally look at it as to 
uh, a balance between a, a, a risk and benefit. You know, we know very clearly there are benefit of taking certain medication, you know, uh, or Parkinson disease medication in controlling some of your symptoms, making you able to perform certain daily life. But we are not. We are also aware that there are certain risks of the medication, you know, and some of these risks is something that we we were able to control and monitor, you know. Yeah. So from the perspective, I think we always try to weigh uh, benefit risks whether it's suitable to be starting uh, start to be started for a certain patient. On the other side is that um, from a lot of perspective of the uh, expert as well, I think it's important to start the medication at a point when it starts to bother a lot of your movement because there's a lot of concern about delaying the treatment. Okay, uh, the, the, I mean, I, because we know Parkinson affect a lot of motor function and it, it does sort of present more in some of the elderly patients. So what is the major concern is, uh, is the complication. What if uh, they are not on medication, their disease or their symptoms get worse, they fall down, they had a fracture, you know, um, or because of the fall, it causes other problems. So, so they are also obviously main reason why sometimes, uh, you know, doctor will want to sort of encourage that uh, patient to start the medication when it start to bother them, you know, so that you don't have such a complication uh, because of fall, because of the movement uh, that that the problem in the movement. Something to take take note also is that um, there might be also some people that worry, you know, I don't want to start a medication, maybe because the medication are uh, making the disease progress even uh, more severe or make worsen the progression of the disease. Uh, but I just want to share with you, there is no really evidence to say that if you start levodopa or cinnamon, madopa a bit earlier, your progression, it will affect your progression. You know, that, that's not really usually the case. Uh, what happened is that in most of the, because Parkinson disease is usually labeled as a neurodegenerative disease, which means that it will advance with age. So which means that it's likely is because of the progression of the problem rather than the medicine causing it. So at the moment, there's no really uh, evidence on that. So somehow what I'm trying to say is that I think the dopamine, you know, um, levodopa, for example, is one of the drugs that's most used to, uh, to sort of mimic dopamine effect. And if you remember the speakers has mentioned, uh, Parkinson is a problem that's uh, lacking in dopamine. So this levodopa mimicking the dopamine action will always be working to a certain extent. It's just that the disease start to progress, then it's sort of losing the action effect. So normally at certain stage, a patient will need to keep on increasing the dose or adjust the dosing or the frequency accordingly to manage their problem as they progress. Okay. And, and my advice is that if you have certain fear about the Parkinson disease medication, uh, please always talk to your doctor so that you can understand very well. Then you can start the discussion as well on you know, when is the best time for you to start the medication or uh, adjustment of certain dosing. All right. Um, another question that sometimes patients ask is that how long uh, does it take for the medication to start working? Um, it does vary uh, individual in, between individual, but of course the other thing is about which medication are we talking about here. But I take your example about the most common medication that we're using is levodopa, example, madopa, cinnamon, you know, uh, uh, they all contain uh, meta, uh, levodopa. Usually it would take about 20 to 30 minutes, which means that once you take it within, you know, hopefully within 30 minutes, you should see some progression in controlling certain effect. But we all know that uh, medication has this pattern, you know, when you, if you look at the diagram that I'm showing here, when you take the medication, your symptoms will start to go away. That's when we are saying the symptoms are controlled. So it's like the on time. So medicine good, working very well. But as the medicine actually effect fading in the body system, because medicine will be cleared out from the body system, then the symptoms, example, tremor, slowing down, rigidity, may start to slowly return. All right. So you get this effect, what we call fading, you know, uh, where the symptoms are no longer controlled and you have the off time. Okay, so this is usually when the medicine effect are slowly going down. So usually what will happen is that in any dosing or any uh, prescription, uh, pres uh, uh, prescribing in terms of Parkinson's disease medicine is that the doctor will usually start from a very low dose and 
as it goes, they will slowly taper the dose. But the other thing that they might sometimes do is because of this fading effect and on-off symptoms effect that you have, they might adjust certain dosing frequency. Example, instead of taking three times, you take four times daily instead, trying to cover and prolong uh, the, the, the off effect, you know. The other thing sometimes they do obviously is to control uh, to change you to a different formula because we have drug formula that lasts a bit longer so they would reduce the off time for you so um, the, that's how the medication somehow work um, how about the side effects of drugs so unfortunately most drugs would have uh, side effects you know so we can't stop that in, in a way so um, but again uh, drugs depends on which drug you're talking about uh, and of course yourself whether you yourself has certain uh, concomitant what, what we say like other problems example if you have a liver problem some of the drugs may not be suitable for you because if you if we give you that drug it will make the liver worse or example some of you may have seizure you know some drugs are not so suitable for uh, people with seizure because it can induce seizure so uh, that's why usually before you start a medication the doctor or the pharmacist might need to know a bit more background about the pro uh, about other problems that you're having so that we can pick certain medication that don't contradict or don't actually make your problem or existing problem worse. But these are some of the examples that you will see with some of the medication. Example, uh, involuntary movement, turning, twisting, what we call a bit abnormal movement. Okay, uh, I mean studies actually shows that usually this style of move, movement happen at the peak time of medication. You know, when we take levodopa uh, up to a certain point, when it hit the peak time, so there were these side effects of sort of too high dose, so you start to get some involuntary movement. Okay, if, if you experience that, then perhaps you can talk to the doctors, perhaps to modify a little bit about for drugs or change the formula a little bit or reduce the dose to a, a little bit uh, lesser. So that might help to, you know, sort of minimize the, the occurrence of this type of problem. The other problem that sometimes people get is uh, nausea vomiting and that could be quite frequent uh, happening sometimes when you have a, a patient that started just started the medication but usually nausea vomiting might just um, improve over time most likely normally but of course if it's keep on bothering you then of course uh, the best way is always to consult the doctor again again maybe get a, a change some some of the formula and other effect example dry mouth dry eyes urinary retention some people may get headache joint pain okay and of course some people will feel that you know you get a bit more hallucination confusion and some people may not even be able to sleep well when you are getting uh, using some of the medication so um, selected medication, not, not exactly levodopa sometimes, but different types of medication. So there are also ways to manage, example, try to avoid the medication at late evening. So that will reduce the problem of like sleeping problem that drugs may give you. So what I'm trying to highlight is that at the end of the day, some of these side effects, there is ways to deal with it. You know, they, they are there are probably ways that we can minimize or reduce or avoid some of it. Okay, to the comfort level that doesn't bother or doesn't affect your life so much in that certain extent. But it requires uh, you to sometimes also inform the doctors or, uh, that you are experiencing certain effects so that these side effects can be actually looked at and be uh, deal with, with whatever measures that can be done. Okay, um, the next thing is about uh, how do you take the medication? I think sometimes people get very confused about uh, should I take the medicine with food? Should I take the medicine without food? Okay, just uh, trying to look at how our body system work is that uh, usually the most common reason why a person, a person want to, or maybe a pharmacist or doctor advise you to take medicine with food is because number one, maybe the food help the absorption. Secondly, because the food caused certain problem, uh, or oh, sorry, the medications cause certain problem. Example, after you take the medication, uh, if with empty stomach, you may tend to get a lot of nausea, vomiting, or you know, or, or uncomfort or discomfort. So uh, that's the reason why sometimes you are advised to take with food. Okay. Uh, and, and as I said, maybe some medication absorb better when there's food. Okay. 
yeah but of course there are some reason why sometimes you are advised not to take with food okay and and that's maybe because with a lot of food the medicine don't absorb very well okay it interferes the absorption okay uh, most likely that's the case but what do, what do we mean by with food and without food because it can be very confusing normally when we say with food means that we expect there is some food in the stomach but when we say without food, actually what we are trying to say is that try to take it with, with an empty stomach in that sense. Yeah. So when do you have uh, food or when do you have food? So usually what happens is that when you take a food and it goes to your stomach, it will be sort of digested, processed and all that. And the food will be probably more or less gone or, or maybe being absorbed or, or digested from your stomach within one or two hours. So which means that logically, when if you were expecting a food inside the stomach, so we are talking about a period between from the time that you take the food within about maybe two hours. So that's the time that we will still be expecting some food inside the stomach. Okay, so any time that is before you take the food or two hours after you take the food, actually, theoretically, your, your stomach is sort of empty already. So there won't be any sort of food inside in that sense. But one thing we have to be very sure, very uh, sure as well. Like if I take the medicine now, okay, and I take my food straight away, okay, honestly speaking, you will still be having the, the, the your stomach, it, your stomach will still have the medicine and the food together. Yeah, so, so I think trying to understand the logic is very important. For example, levodopa, like I said, uh, which is a cinnamon madopa uh, that contains levodopa, what happens is that this medication, if you have a lot of food in the stomach, especially if it's high protein food, eh, it will reduce the absorption of the medicine. So the, me the medicine doesn't get very good absorption if you have a lot of high protein food inside the stomach. So that's the reason why we would advise that it's best that you take 30 minutes before the food. So which means that you take, if you would like to have food, you try to take your medication first, 30 minutes first, take it so that your medicine go into your stomach, get absorbed, you know, uh, then only you start taking the food. But of course, we know that some people experience some nausea vomiting effect. So that's the time that we advise perhaps then you will have to take with the food. Okay, so you might be asking then, oh, then my levodopa don't get absorbed. Don't worry about it. Ultimately, I think um, uh, the dosing might need to be adjusted accordingly, you know, based on uh, how you responded if you always take with food. So my advice is always try to keep it consistent. You know, um, if you want best effects, seriously, uh, uh, definitely I would encourage that you take with, without food, like 30 minutes before food uh, for levodopa. But, uh, but of course, if you still experience some nausea, vomiting, especially when you start taking it, uh, take it with food and, and slowly try to see whether you can start to get, uh, you know, lesser and lesser nausea, vomiting effect, then you can switch to take uh, before meal then. For other medication, okay, it's best that you consult a pharmacist, you know, uh, they, because there are some medication, perhaps we will suggest that you take with food. And interestingly, some medication doesn't matter. You can take before, you can take after. It doesn't have any impact at all. So um, there are some drugs that has impacts, some drugs don't have. So it's very, very depending on the drug itself. So the, the best way to deal with it is really to check with the pharmacist when you uh, get the medication, okay, if they have forgotten to counsel you on that. Okay, um, let's go to the next questions. Um, okay. I think some uh, what we struggle sometimes is that patients forget to take the medication. Okay, and, and is there a way that we can uh, sort of help you to remember to take certain medication? Uh, but my advice is always that you um, need to understand why are you not taking your medication. I think if you are forgetting to take medication, example, you cannot remember the time, then obviously I think with technology now, uh, sorry, uh, with uh, what we have now, you can consider getting a pill box, you know, some medication maybe can be arranged into pill box, you know, help you to remember what to take in the morning, what to take in the afternoon, what to take in the night, you know, so that might help as a reminder. The other way, of course, is that with, with all of us now with mobile and all that is to set a reminder inside your mobile, you know, have a, have a, have the mobile to ring at maybe uh, eight o'clock in the morning, uh, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, you know, things like that. So that it will keep on reminding you to take uh, medicine. I think most of the people, if you have 
make it as a habit, you will just automatically somehow remember in that sense. But I also want to highlight that uh, there are also services that can help you. Not all pharmacy do that, but selected community pharmacy. Uh, I'm not trying to market here, but uh, I know our pro pharmacy actually do this type of service. So they help a patient to pack all their medication into small little uh, package like that. So this is like a pack medicine. So this is extra service. And I know that they provide service to their own customers or their own patient that buy medicine from them in that sense. So um, like I said, I'm not trying to market that, but it is also one option that could consider if you are having a very, very big problem in trying to remember your medication. But of course, there are some people that uh, reluctantly or somehow not able to follow because of certain uncertainties. Example, you are fear about your medication, you're worried. You think you are causing is causing certain side effects and you're worried about that. I think all these are logical and somehow um, I would say that it's important that it's brought up to be discussed with the doctor so that um, I think it has to be very honest. You know, why are you not taking medication? What exactly are you uncertain of? Uh, only because we know what are your uncertainties, then doctors or pharmacists are able to counsel accordingly and help to help you in managing your medicine better. We know this is a long-term medication and it's likely that you might have to take uh, long um, in throughout your life. You know, there's no, probably you won't be able to stop at certain point. That's why I think, uh, I think if we work together with you, or I mean, I mean the pharmacists and doctors and working together with the patient, I think it will be able to come up with some uh, better solution or better remediation in managing the medicine. Okay, the other thing is about uh, supplementary medicine, over-the-counter medicine, say uh, over-the-counter medicine here, uh, what I meant is that um, medicine example uh, that you go to pharmacy, uh, uh, cold and flu type medicine example, the Panadol, you know, other types of constipation medicine that you can just take from the shelf. So these are what we call the over-the-counter, okay? You don't need the pharmacist to actually uh, buy it at all, yeah. And the other medicine that sometimes people ask is about the herbal. Should I, can I take herbal together with my uh, Parkinson medicine, this, uh, Parkinson disease medicine, or even any medicine, or even supplements, you know? Can I take that? Um, I think what you have to uh, understand is that there are large numbers of actually evidence within, uh, you know, in, in the internet. If you just Google, you will find a lot of things about lifestyle, dietary, nutrition, physical treatment, you know, they are frequently promoted uh, to Parkinson disease patient or to be used together. I mean, some of these supplements uh, would include ginkgo, example, fish oil. Okay, there are some that uh, will market to use selenium as well because of their uh, antioxidative effect. I think many of time, if they are uh, sort of marketing or some are promoting supplements or herbal, the, there are usually some reasonable justification. Example, the supplement has a mechanism to protect the, the nerve, you know, or a certain ways or theories to protect the, the nerve. Um, I mean, as a pharmacist, I'm not saying that uh, it's, it's, it's not possible, you know, because the, the data can be very genuine. It does have evidence that it will protect the nerve and all that. But I think what us struggle the most is because there are not very much uh, documented or evidence or strong evidence in how it's used with patient, uh, you know, when it's actually taking together with patient when they are handling, uh, when they're having Parkinson's disease at certain stage, or even when they're taking with the medicine. So there are very little thing that we know at the moment is that how, when you take herbal, when you take supplement together with your medication, how they interact, how they affect each other, whether they actually give you benefit. Uh, I think this is the part where we are still don't have very much evidence about it. So unfortunately, you know, we, there, there aren't that many research going on in that area because it's very difficult to control. But on the other side is that I, I know herbal supplement have very little or mine, very little or mild potential side effects. So which means that logically, it doesn't harm your Parkinson's disease. Uh, you know, it may not give you much problem in terms of managing your Parkinson's disease and all that. But like I said, we're just not sure whether they actually interact with some of the medication. I think that's the major concern. I think similarly to some of the over-the-counter medicine, they are usually labeled as quite safe. Like example, Panadol. 
you know, some of you go to pharmacy or go to even some stores, you buy a strip of Panadols and all that. Okay, we know it's actually quite safe usually for people to take, even if you have Parkinson's disease, unlikely it's going to cause any problem in that sense, it's pretty safe. But, but of course, if you are trying to use selected medicine, sometimes it's good also to consult the pharmacist whether they are problem or they're going to be interaction. Because I just give you some example, example, um, uh, like, like what we have, the um, medicine for gastric what we call antacid, you know. So, um, example, if you have a stomach problem, gastric, you like to get some what we call antacid. This antacid usually are in solution form or pill form, and usually you can just grab it in the shelf in a pharmacy. And and usually, uh, what happen is that this antacid, this medicine called antacid, they will contain substance like calcium inside, uh, magnesium inside, sodium carbonate, uh, bicarbonate. What they do is that they will help to relieve some of your gastric problems and symptoms. But unfortunately, this tablet, uh, if you take it together with your Madopa cinnamon that contain the Levodopa, uh, what happened is that they will, this antacid, because it contains quite numbers of minerals, it will actually reduce the absorption of the Levodopa. So, you know, so they, they might be possibility sometimes interaction like that. So, so that's why what I'm saying is that, and of course, there might be also interaction with other medication that you're taking. So what I'm saying that is that ultimately, it's best that if you are uh, wanting to start any uh, supplements, herbal medication, you know, best to consult the doctor, discuss and let your doctor know about it. So that at least if even yes or no, there's someone that can monitor and advise you how to how to uh, monitor certain signs. Or if you are taking any over-the-counter medicine, try to consult the pharmacist as well. Make sure that you know you're taking Parkinson's disease medicine and it doesn't interact with the medication. And at the same time, they can also advise you if there is any other types of uh, medication that might be more suitable for you compared to what you can just grab from the counter. So I think that that's something quite important to take note. Okay, I think this is my last question, which is like, uh, uh, what if you have medicine um, you don't want to take? So why, how do you dispose it or what should you do? Okay, the most simplest way is usually to bring the medicine back to the hospital. So um, in government, basically the Ministry of Health, government hospital or government uh, health clinic, there is usually what they call returning medicine campaign. So uh, what I'll advise you, of course, you can put all your medicine into a bag, but before you do that, try to just remove all your personal detail. For example, your name, address, or phone number, whatever that's on the label, uh, you can just remove it if you want to, so that your identity is also protected to a certain extent. So you can put all your medicine into the bag, and if you ever go back to this government hospital or government clinic, bring along, okay? You can pass it to the pharmacy department, and in some cases, uh, the pharmacy themselves might have uh, some uh, uh, boxes or notice where you can put the medicine. But if they don't have, you just walk to the pharmacy counter and tell and ask them, where can I, uh, I'd like to dispose this medicine, can I pass it back to you? So they will actually pass it back. Uh, they will actually take it back. Okay. I think what is our general advice is that uh, do not dispose it to any garbage bin flushed into the toilet. Partly because our main concern is about the environment. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, these medication are, are, are hitting, are, are going into the drainage station and it recycle, you know. So we are also taking some water, which is filtered and things like that. So you don't want to affect the environment to a certain extent. So I think it's always good not to uh, flush of any types of medicine, including even Parkinson's disease medicine or even any types of medicine. Okay. And the other advice, of course, is that try not to share your medication if you're not sure whether it's suitable for the person or not. So because um, usually medicine are prescribed to you and is, is based on your condition, may not always be suitable for others. So do not give to your unused medicine to someone that's uh, for special medicine that's prescribed to you, but not for them. I think uh, that's all for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh,
Okay, thank you very much to Dr. Wang for the insightful sharing. Through your excellent sharing session, I am sure that the, partic the participants are more aware of the Parkinson's disease medication now.